My name's Scott Geiselhart. I'm a retired firefighter from a small town in Minnesota, Frazee, Minnesota. Um, I was a firefighter for 24 years. Worked my way up from captain up to assistant chief. I was supposed to be the chief. They were expecting me to be chief, but I had to step down um, and step away from the fire department for a while. And I'll be sharing with you the circumstances around that. Frazee is a small town, 1,300 population. We're volunteer firefighters. We uh, respond to calls that a lot of times we know the victims. We have a, you know, we have a railroad track coming through town. We got a river. We got three highways that come through town. But still, a lot of our calls are the residents that we know. Sometimes they're related to us. Sometimes they're even firefighters, families, for you know, kids, parents, whatever. And uh, back in '94, when I moved to Frazee, I moved there because I wanted to build a shop there. I wanted to eventually get into auto repair there because I was a mechanic at Nearsons, which is in Detroit Lakes, a dealership. And uh, in 98, I made that dream happen. But back in 95, my boss came up to me, which was a firefighter, handed me this application for the fire department. Never thought about being a firefighter in my life. He goes, we could use you. You're a mechanic. We could use the skills on the fire department. And I figured, well, I'm in this community. I want to give back. So I, so I filled the application out, didn't think much of it. A few days later, he comes back and goes, yeah, your, your first meeting's on this date. And I'm like, wow, okay, I guess I'm a firefighter now. So they accepted me. The, the, it was a good old boys back then. They just voted on it. It wasn't really like a resume or anything I had to put in. Firefighters and first responders are, are a family. We look out for each other. And moving to this new community from Detroit Lakes, which is only about 15 miles away, it helped me get to know a lot of people in town. Next thing you know, I'm on the city council, I'm president of sportsman club, all sorts of things. I mean, they had me going, you know, they were looking for volunteers and I just happened to accidentally raise my hand once. <laughs> but in the fire department, something we didn't have was auto extrication, the jaws of life. We relied on Detroit Lakes to get to Frazee and do the auto extrication for our fire department because it was expensive to get the jaws of life and get and the training is intense. But the thing is, is we have a golden hour that they give us to get the, the victim to the hospital. And if we're sitting there waiting 15 minutes for the jaws of life there, that's a quarter of that time. We were losing the patients. I mean, not necessarily losing, but we we're losing that golden hour standard that we put ourselves to. So we decided to train we decided to buy the Jaws of Life, the Gumby suits, which is ice water rescue suits, the lift bags, the lift vehicles, spreaders, you name it, we bought it. And um, the community donated to help us do that. So there we were 15 minutes ahead of what we were prior to that. We had a lot of mechanics on our fire department, a lot of mechanical people, a lot of farmers, and uh, we trained hard. And it was just, just almost a natural for us. And Detroit Lakes gave us the thumbs up. It's like, yeah, you guys get there. You guys have the training now. We'll, we'll roll in too. And when you need help, we'll step in and help you guys. And uh, we felt pretty good about that. It's like, wow, you know, we got the jaws of life. We can do some, we can really help people now. Something we didn't train for was the gruesome scenes that we were going to see. We've seen the car accidents, but. When you're in there really close with them, taking them out of the vehicle, it's really close and personal. We didn't train about mental health. We didn't train about, okay, we get done with the scene, we go back to the fire station, put the gear away, get the truck ready to roll out to the next call, and we leave. We go back to our jobs, we go back home, try to go to sleep. We might even go back to a birthday party of one of our kids, and we're supposed to forget about what we just seen. I tried to do that. I tried to stuff it back in my head. I told myself, hey, we're seeing these things. We didn't create them. We're making them better. Not my problem, man. I'm a firefighter. I'm, I'm strong. I'm tough. Well, I started having some nightmares. I drank a lot in my life. And my drinking got worse. 
I had a shop that I opened in town, an auto repair shop. Had good business, but it happened to be right across the street from the liquor store. So I started after work, I started going over to the liquor store. Started staying away from my kids and my family. Found a way to numb myself. I didn't think it was a big deal. I'm out with my friends, you know, we're in pool leagues, we're doing all sorts of things. You know, I knew something wasn't right though because I wasn't spending time with my kids. I didn't feel like I loved them as much as I really should have. I didn't want to get close to them. I took care of them, I provided for them. But my anger started to pop up, short fused. I would start yelling at them and yelling at the three people I loved the most. And I couldn't understand why I was doing this. It was just all of a sudden, it was like this Jekyll and Hyde and I would start getting angry. And I'd, I'd, I'd call them names. I never physically hurt them, but the verbal abuse was horrible. I can't even say the things I've said to them. And unfortunately, I can't take those words back either. I knew something was wrong with me. I knew something was changing in me. My girlfriend at the time, she went and talked to all the fire department, the whole, all of every firefighter in the department, said, Scott's changing. He's not the same person. He's at home, he's yelling at us. He's, he's changed a lot. He's angry all the time. And they said, hey, that's just, you know, he's got a business. You know, he's all right around the fire department. We don't see it. And at my shop, I could, I could work with my customers and be just this really nice guy to my customers. They'd leave and I'd turn and just be a total asshole to my kids or to my girlfriend. And the anger, I'd take it out on them. Well, it continued to get worse. And I was at a music festival with some friends of mine and uh, I couldn't understand how they could party all night long. And I'd get up in the morning, they did cracking beers, eight o'clock, seven o'clock, eight o'clock in the morning. I'm like, what the heck? They got the fire going still? They're still partying? Are you kidding me? I went to sleep at two. I couldn't stay up. Then they inter inter introduced me to that little white line, meth. I'd never done drugs. I did some marijuana before that, but not until after I was 30. I was against drugs of any kind. But I said, what the heck, I'm gonna try it. They said, man, it's great. You know, you won't get addicted. It's, you know, they were doing it and they weren't addicts. So I snorted a line, stayed awake, partied my butt off. Wow, that was good. Monday morning came, went to work. No side effects, no nothing. Did my job, ran the business. No big deal. A month or so later, we're out partied again. They chopped a line for me and I snorted it. Partied all weekend with them. You know, obviously stayed away from my family because I was partying all weekend with them. Didn't see an issue with it. Monday morning came still. Did my job. I was told that if you, you did a line of meth, you'd be hooked. <laughs> I'm like, that's not true anymore, man. I can handle this. It's, I'm not an addict. How can, how can they tell me, you know, it was a lie. They told me a lie because I'm doing this. I had control of it. Nightmares kept getting bad. The anger kept getting worse. All my symptoms of recklessness and drinking a lot and starting to do a little more meth, numbing myself, not loving anybody, not letting anybody into my life, went on and in 2010, I built my own shop. And this shop was amazing. It was almost as big as this room. Heated floor, air conditioned, 73 degrees all the time in there. It was awesome. I mean, I, I couldn't handle the heat. It was weird because with, along with the anger came something that I couldn't be out in direct sunlight. Or when it was like 90 degrees out, no way, man. I was in the air conditioning. I wasn't going outside. Another symptom that I, didn't, I wasn't aware of. Something else happened around the same time. See, before that, we had all these car accidents where we knew the people, they slowly grew on us. We had drownings where we couldn't, you know, resuscitate them. And they told us that they could be underwater for an hour and you can resuscitate them in cold water and they could live a normal life. And we weren't seeing that, we were losing them. And I started to feel like, you know, they train us to save lives and I wasn't saving any lives, we were losing. I didn't count the victories. 
I was counting them. I was counting the losses. But when I built this shop, we had another car accident. It was a young individual in high school on his way home from a sporting event. It was icy roads, got into a corner, lost control. Vehicle rolled into a swamp. Went upside down, ice cold water, dark. And the kid was underwater for 10 minutes before we, re before we recovered him. They revived him, they got him here to Fargo. We were partying. 10 minutes is nothing for a high school kid to be underwater. I mean, there was no physical damage to his body. We were celebrating, man. They said he's gonna make a full recovery. Everything was perfect. A month later, a firefighter came in to the fire, into, my, into my shop and said, uh, Scott, he died. He died from a lung infection. It was like somebody hit me in the gut with a sledgehammer. I was the one that killed him. My mind switched that day. I told myself that I was the one that killed him. See, I was in that ice water rescue suit. I reached into the window that we broke and drug him out and held him as they pulled me to shore. I screwed up somewhere. I didn't cover his mouth. Something I did caused that. I started looking at all the other accidents. I did something wrong on every one of them. I told myself I was jinxed. I was the Grim Reaper. The whole world went negative. I'd been doing meth while building the shop so I could work extra hours. Gave me more energy, work all night, get more done. I justified it because if I did one more hour of labor in a day and billable labor, 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 labor that would cover the meth cost. And it did, so I was justifying it in my mind. And still, I didn't have scabs all over me. I wasn't all jittery. I was running a business. Nobody had a clue. I wasn't selling it. My dealer would come straight to my shop. I had 18 surveillance cameras in my shop and outside my shop. There was no place he could hide when we were doing this deal. He didn't care. He trusted me. I bought it direct. I was getting a hell of a good deal. I had an ounce of meth on reserve at all time. That's a lot of meth. In 2012, I was a real mess. I stayed down at my shop all the time. I was angry with my kids all the time. I just couldn't control my anger. The nightmares, I was seeing my own kids falling out of the sky on fire or in a car accident and, and I was paralyzed or the jaws of life wouldn't work and my kids were screaming at me to help them. Every time I closed my eyes, that would happen. In 2012, my girlfriend said, to hell with you. Enough is enough. After 18 years, she left me, took our two kids with her. And I didn't blame her one bit. I knew I was a monster. I turned into this person that I couldn't control anymore. I started leaning on meth to survive. I started snorting a meth, a line of meth every hour to stay awake from my nightmares. I did that for two years, still running a shop, but with no sleep. I wasn't all jittery. I don't even know how the hell my body took it. I was running my shop on surveillance cameras. The parts would come in, the parts guy would come up. I'd open the door for him, otherwise he'd be locked. Windows were all darkened. I could be in there in the middle of the night working and lights on, just, I mean, way brighter than this. And if you're on the outside of the building, you could never tell I was in there. I just wanted to be alone and, and in my own world. I used to cuss and swear at God, trying to get him pissed off so he'd just kill me. I was very suicidal, but I couldn't, I couldn't do it. A friend of mine, years earlier, took his own life, and he had two kids. And I went to that funeral. When I seen his kids jump on the casket as they were putting them down on the ground, say, Daddy, wake up, Daddy, wake up. I told myself I'd never, ever going to do that to my kids, ever. July of 2000, 2014 comes. And I went over to my ex-girlfriend's apartment. And while I was in there, something switched in me again. And I got angry. Started yelling at my kids really bad. 
I didn't. I never physically hurt them, but me calling them freeloaders, your own kids. That was it. Was very hurtful to me, and I knew I had to get out over there. I many times I left, saying, "I don't care. I'm just going to go kill myself. I'm going to burn the house down with me, and you guys don't deserve anything." That's how twisted my mind got. But that day, when I left, I told myself, "I've got to destroy this monster." Because one of these days I'm going to go crazy and I'm going to physically hurt somebody. I had a hit list. I was homicidal. I was going to take out bad people in the in the community that I felt were bad. I mean, it was weird. I mean, I. It was scary. I never acted on it, thank God. But that day when I got down to the shop, and in my office, huge, huge office big cherry desk, big horseshoe cherry desk. I sat down at my desk. Insurance papers had been under plastic for months underneath my paperwork. I cleared off the paperwork so they were viewable. Enough plastic on them. I reached into my drawer, pulled out my 44 Magnum revolver and put it to my head and pulled the trigger. Just that fast. I wanted to be dead. The hammer came down and clicked. I freaked out because I couldn't understand how that gun just clicked because it was, it was my favorite gun. That thing was supposed to take my head off. It was supposed to do the job. And I'm looking on the floor for my body. I jump up on the desk behind me scared because I slammed the gun down on the desk. I thought it was going to go off and blow my eardrums out. I thought somehow it was going to spin around and shoot me. I, I couldn't understand what just happened because it was supposed to go off. Finally, after a little bit, I jumped down, grabbed the gun, opened the cylinders up and dumped the cylinders out, all the, all the shells. And when I laid the gun down on the desk, the cylinder wanted to close. And I felt like there was a bullet still in the barrel or something. I don't know, it was weird, but I had to put a pen in the cylinder so that cylinder wouldn't close all the way so the gun couldn't work, even when it was empty. I also looked at the rounds, and there wasn't a dimple in any of the primers. I was looking for which round failed and there was no dimple. On that gun, the revolver comes down, it has to hit something to click. I was really confused. I was sitting at my desk and my keyboard was in front of me. I decided to do a Google search. I put in anger, nightmares, flashback, and drugs. Hit enter on a Google search, PTSD. <laughs> Uh-uh, I don't have PTSD. I've never been in the military. Nope, that's not it. I opened up the PTSD site. It was a Mayo Clinic. Top line, high risk, veterans and first responders. I got pissed. 18 years of being on the fire department, nobody talked about mental health. I found out more firefighters are taking their own lives than dying a line of duty deaths. It was the same for first responders, for almost all first responders. I looked at the symptoms. Holy crap, I've got them, almost all of them. How could that be? I looked at the therapies and was like, well, you mean I can actually go and get help for this stuff? There's a way out. It's not, it doesn't have to be permanent. I studied PTSD all day and all night because I wasn't sleeping. I was still doing meth, a line an hour, minimum. Next morning at 8 o'clock, I went over to my ex-girlfriend's house. And she was scared because I, I was out of control the day before yelling at him. She opened the door up a little bit and I barged through. I, opened, I pushed the door open. I got in the room. I'm yelling. I've got PTSD. I've got PTSD. I found it. I'm not a monster. I'm, I can get help. I was excited because I did all this research. And it's like, I'm not this crazy person, man. There's a reason why I was doing this. She was backing down the hallway with, my, with our two kids behind her, protecting our two kids from me. Our two kids were looking around her, scared to death of me. They thought I was there to physically hurt them. I left there, went back down to the shop. The gun was still laying there. The rounds were still laying there. I just thought, nobody's ever going to trust me ever again. They don't believe me. They don't get it. And I thought about loading that gun. 
and, and just clicking it till it went off. But instead, I sat down and started making phone calls. I had a list of phone numbers I had gathered over the years. The first call, 12 times, I called a suicide hotline and nobody answered. This is in 2014. I called three other helplines that were set up for first responders that my chief gave me five years prior. Never asked why I wanted them. I asked for them, he gave them to me. I called all three of those. They were all disconnected, no longer in service. No forwarding phone numbers, no nothing, just out of service. Next phone call was to a police officer, a friend of mine. I told him I'd just try to kill myself. So I've got PTSD, can you, come, can you come out and we can talk? And you can go over and talk to my ex-girlfriend, explain things to her. He said he was gonna come pick me up and he was gonna take me to the hospital. All I heard him say is I was gonna get locked up. I'm going to the funny farm. I asked him just to talk and he just come over here and we just talk. He didn't want nothing to do with that. His job was take me to the hospital. I told him I had two phone calls left. If I didn't get through to anybody, I'll call him back. And I hung the phone up. My surveillance cameras were inside and outside, and I sat down and watched the monitor. But before I did that, I went out and put my acetylene tanks, my propane tanks out in my shop where I could see them from the office door, loaded up my SKS with tracer rounds. And I don't know if it would have done anything or not, but if a squad car would have pulled by or drove by, I probably would have blown the shop up with me in it, not to hurt anybody else, but I wasn't gonna be locked up like an animal. I wanted to talk to somebody. Thank God he didn't come by. He did call some other officers in. I later found out that they, they were sneaking around outside. They knew I had the cameras, obviously, because they used my videos on other crimes that they were catching people. But they gave him my space. The next phone call I made was to a phone number that was on our whiteboard in the front of the fire department. It was kind of like an EAP, but it was a lady that we're supposed to call. I think she was a therapist. And I called the phone number. She answered, I talked to her, and I said, hey, I tried to kill myself. I said, I've got, I've got PTSD, I've got all symptoms. I, I mean, I I'm, I'm, feel like I've gone crazy. I told her I, I just tried to kill myself. And she set me up for an appointment for a week and a half out. I hung the phone up, and I remember looking at my monitor. It was a beautiful day outside. I knew I wasn't going to see the sunset. I knew that gun was going to be against my head as soon as this next phone call doesn't work. I called, and then the last phone number I had on my list, and it was to a first responder helpline that's nationwide. I called it, staring at the gun. They answered in two rings. I was screaming into the phone, I've got PTSD, I'm gonna kill myself, you gotta help me. I vented for a long time, I wouldn't let him get a word in sideways, but finally he asked my name. I said, oh, Scott. And he said, Scott, we've got you. And it was like he reached through the phone and held me in his hands. He said, Scott, we've got you. You're not alone. We know about PTSD, we know about addiction. We're here for you, we're gonna get through this together. I couldn't believe what I was hearing, I could breathe again. Not only did this firefighter that was a captain from a large city talk to me, but he gave me a phone number for a police chief in Chicago, a fire chief in New York. Anytime I called them, they stopped everything just to listen and talk to me and help me. This guy calmed me down. He got me out of that suicidal state. He let me know that there was hope. He knew about addiction. He lived it. He knew about PTSD. He lived it. He told me about all these other firefighters out there and police officers and EMTs that have lived it, and they're still alive and they're doing good. I didn't tell him about the meth, because I was ashamed. He talked to me about EMDR eye movement desensitization reprocessing. I didn't know what it was. It was one of the therapies for, for PTSD. So he gave me, you know, kind of like some homework, so I looked into it. I spent, again, that day and that night looking at this EMDR, 
But prior to that, after I hung the phone up, I called, actually it was the village here in Fargo, to set up an appointment. And they set me up with an appointment for the very next morning at 8 o'clock, the first opening of the day. I couldn't believe it. I mean, this other lady just told me she was a week and a half out. All of a sudden, I'm getting an appointment for 8 o'clock the next morning. I have no doubt that they called and said, if this guy calls, you got to get him in immediately. They saved my life. I did this therapy. I went in 8 o'clock after studying this witchcraft. I thought it was witchcraft, EMDR stuff. I studied this and said, okay, they're going to hypnotize me and I'm going to be clucking like a chicken or something. And they're going to videotape it and make fun of me or something. You know, it's like my mind just wasn't all there yet. But I went in, made the appointment, or made the, made the session, and we talked about things. And for the first two sessions, we are trying to figure out why it was so cold and what, what was it the trauma was. And I'm not sure if I didn't tell him I was a firefighter or what the deal was, but we didn't, I didn't connect them dots yet. I did what a lot of guys do. I blamed it on a woman. All my problems were because of a relationship. Some girl broke my heart one time. That's why I'm so cold and I don't love anybody and I'm numb. And that's what I blamed it on. So third session, I knew we were going to do this EMDR with the light bar and the vibrating pads. And, and I'm in the parking lot of the village. And you got to understand, I couldn't do anything without math. So I chopped three huge lines, and I snorted three huge lines before I went in to do this, th this therapy. And I went in there, and we started talking about my ex-girlfriends, trying to make a connection there and some stuff I was trying to blame it on. And all of a sudden, boom, here comes the car accidents. And I was trying to push them away, trying to push them away, but finally I just focused on one and went with it. Holy buckets. It, it felt like I was the movie, the movie Green Mile, where the guy's got the bugs coming out of his mouth. That's what it felt like. Man, I was like, holy crap, where's this stuff coming from? I didn't want to think about this. It was coming out. The stuff I stuffed in the back of my head, I was letting it come out. We didn't do debriefings. So this was a debriefing for 15 years of crisis and trauma. And it, it was like, wow, this is awesome. I let a lot out that day. Got done with the session. I know I didn't close it down right. I mean, there was so much coming out, and I wanted it out of my head. It was like an infection. I wanted it out. But on the way home on Highway 10, by Glendon, August the 5th, it was a sunflower field with huge yellow heads of, sun, of sunflowers. I swear to God, it was not there when I went there because I didn't see it. I pulled over and I had to walk into the sunflower field. It's like, holy, where'd this come from? I was looking at the blue sky and the white clouds. I could hear the birds again. And that's where the title Seeing in Color comes from. I could see in color again. I could tell you what color things were before, but everything's like neon. And it's like, holy crap, I could breathe. I could feel my chest rising. I could feel the air coming in my body. I was alive again. That was after the first session. We did four more sessions after that, and man, the last one, I'm just sitting there smiling. I mean, something I never really, I mean, it really, I couldn't, my cheeks hurt from smiling so much. And he goes, I think we've gotten most of it out. I think, I, I think you're all right, because all you've been doing is sitting here smiling. And it's like total difference between the person that walked in there a month earlier. So we finished the sessions, and I was feeling the car, and I was leaving the house, and I looked over at the picnic table. See, when I was 18 years old, 17 years old, I used to jump over picnic tables in the city park across from where we used to live. And I'd do this in cowboy boots even. You know, showing off the girls more than anything. But I told my sons, I said, watch this. You see that picnic table over there? And here I am, 46 years old. I took a run at this picnic table, and I tried to jump it. I almost made it. Came down really hard, thought I sprained my ankle, thought I broke my leg. Look around, here's all the neighbors outside standing like, what the heck, he's crazy again. You know, I, when I went through this, I was very verbal about what, I, what happened to me. I told everybody, I couldn't shut up about, hey, PTSD, man. I had it, I had a suicide attempt, and here they're looking out there watching me jump picnic tables, like, this guy's out of his mind. I walked back to the car and my sons were like, dad, that was pretty impressive. And I'm like, well, I used to be able to do it. But I'd stretched out for two weeks. 
And I went out and took another run at it. And I made it. And none of the neighbors were outside. Not even their damn dogs were outside. It's like, this isn't fair. But I'm good with that. I'm not trying it again. But the amazing difference between a month. But after that first session, where I started seeing in color again, I spent a whole week in bed. I'd get up, want to watch TV, want to eat. I was all over the place. My mind was opened up. I could start sleeping after that first session. It was something else that happened August 5th, 2014. It was the last meth I've done. I walked away from a cold turkey all by myself. I was doing a line an hour. I went down to my shop and destroyed every part of drugs, anything. I had picture frames in three or four places around my shop that would slide inside a box of Christmas lights, fit perfectly inside the box. That whole frame, I'd, I'd, I'd keep them full of lines. It was a lot of meth on each one of those, but I could go and sneak away and snort a line. Even if somebody was right behind me, I could sneak in there quick, and I was good at hiding it. I used to carry 322 shells in my pocket, my little drug pocket, I call it. I emptied the gunpowder out, and I washed the shells out of there because I didn't want no gunpowder in my nose. Chop up meth, put the meth in there, put the lead back in, carry those 320 shoot two shells around. I couldn't go an hour without meth. So here I am, assistant chief on the fire department. Doing it right in front of people, they didn't have a clue. I went from assistant chief to a red helmet to a captain, to a yellow helmet, a firefighter, to not making any trainings, not making any meetings, making excuses for everything so I wouldn't have to be there. Car accidents would happen. I had the radio. I could hear all the traffic. If it was a bad one, instead of racing out the door like I used to and loving being a firefighter, I'd reach in my drawer and I'd pull out my meth and start snorting lines until the last truck left. Then I'd get down there. Made excuses for why I couldn't be there on time. I was supposed to be the next chief. I told him, no way. I said, I'm too busy. I was too high on math. I wasn't going to risk anybody else's life. I knew the day I, the day was coming where I was going to get arrested. And thankfully, it never happened. Oh, man, now, looking back and, and remembering, I'm never going to be free of math. How can you walk away from this kind of an addiction? You're never, ever going to be free from it. And then even then, I thought back even earlier, God, remember when you were just doing this for fun and you had control of it? Now meth has control of you, and the only way out you can see is suicide. I didn't know about all this other stuff. Mental health was the root of my addiction. Once I took care of my mental health, I didn't need to numb myself anymore. I didn't have to run from my demons. I was honest with myself. It was tough. It was, it was really tough. I had to forgive myself for the things I've done to my kids the words that I can't take back. I was Christmas shopping in Fargo here. You know, four months after my suicide attempt, and my son, my younger son, he was 13 at the time, and he was in the vehicle with me. And, and I remember the exact location. But I looked over at him, I said, you know, I'm really glad that gun didn't go off. And my son looked at me and said, Dad, the gun did go off. It killed the bad dad. And to hear him say that and to tell me how much I'd changed and the things I had done that I couldn't remember doing and the things I said to him. But for him to be open and honest with me and, and also recognize the positives, wow. He wanted to be around me again. It took a little while for my older son. He was a little older. It took a little longer for him. My ex-girlfriend... Well, after the EMDR, I fell in love with her. I seen that she had a little mole on her top lip, something I didn't notice for 18 years. I was messed up for a long time, not just from the car accidents, from things that happened in my life, but to be able to see people's faces again. Our relationships, 
there was too much damage. You know, we get along, we're, we're parents. She went her way, I went my way. I want to show you a brief video clip of my life before therapy. everything right, they still die. In the end, they always die. This is fair. They screwed up somewhere. Quit thinking about it. Quit thinking about it. Why are you doing this to me, God? Why am I this messed I'm up? always seeing this. Can't stop this. I can't do this anymore. I screwed up. Okay, Dad. This isn't fair. That was not an actual video, obviously, but that's what happened one day when I left the fire station and went home from a car accident where we lost a kid. I don't remember driving home. Don't remember getting out of the car. All I remember is that baseball hit my chest and how far gone I was. I, I didn't even remember driving around. I blocked things out and I blacked out a lot of things. The therapy helped. The drugs were obviously having a huge effect. The heat, being in direct sunlight, felt like I was burning. I don't know how much that was PTSD and how much was meth. The combination, oh by God, I shouldn't be alive. You've seen before and after pictures. That's a younger, much stronger, physically healthier guy on the left. But look at how dark those eyes are. There's no color. And then there's the one after therapy. Man, life is so much different. I didn't think I was ever going to be able to free, be free of meth and the nightmares and the flashbacks and the anger. And I have no symptoms of PTSD. I went and talked to the fire department after I, after my suicide attempt when I was doing therapy and I told them I had to take a leave of absence. I told them about the suicide attempt. I told them about my diagnosis. I told them I wasn't sure if I'm gonna come back to the fire department and I apologized to them for all the crap that I caused because I was that Mr. Negative about everything. I, I wasn't like that all the time. I was the guy that trained for extrication, for auto extrication. They had me way up here on this pedestal. They seen things that was going on in my life, but they didn't dare ask. They figured I was just busy at the shop. I had a lot of stress in my life. But when I was telling them I was going to take a leave of absence, I looked over at the agenda that was in front of my, my friend, and I seen the teardrops hitting the agenda. So I know I wasn't the only one suffering. I left the room, and they said it was quiet for minutes. Nobody wanted to say anything. They didn't know what to say. I blew them out of the water. They had no idea. Again, if this could happen to Scott, my God, he's, he's like the, you know, they had me like a superhero or something. I mean, I, I was good at auto extrication. But I wasn't good at taking care of myself. I, I was one of the leaders. I was supposed to be watching out for others. And yet after one of the trainings, the only time I heard anybody say anything about PTSD was one of the trainers left the room and as, as he was walking from the front of the room, he said, oh, by the way, look all for PTSD. I was assistant chief. I looked around the room. I looked at the veterans. They're okay, man. They, I know they got back up. You know, they've got the military stuff. They've been debriefed and taught about PTSD. I didn't even know what PTSD was. And on second of that, I was high on meth when I was looking around that room. I could have killed somebody. Again, I wasn't all scabbed out, I was running a shop. It blew people's mind when they found out how bad I was, how, how far gone I was. It also blew their mind when they seen all of a sudden, here's Scott, and wow. Yeah, over the years he faded, man. He was changing, but wow, he changed back. Look at this guy, it's like holy buckets. 
we had a bad car accident one day. Actually, I'm going to back up a little bit. We had a bartender that I used to go over to the bar and see, and, and she always had me smiling before I had a bottle of beer in front of me. And one day she had a necklace on. It was a little tennis shoe necklace. And I thought that was pretty cool. You know, I'm like, you know, I found out where she bought it. I'm like, I'm going to buy this for my girlfriend because she'll actually wear this. And this was years before I reached out for help. But next morning, I was planning on going to get this necklace, and 6 o'clock, the pager went off. And it was an auto accident. We go out to this auto accident, and a friend of mine, my drinking buddy, was out there already. He wasn't a firefighter at this time. He pushed me out of way, and he says, Scott, you can't go to this one. you got to stay back. And I said, no, i got to do my job. i got to get in there. And I pushed him out of the way. And I popped the hood on the car to cut battery cables so the airbag won't go off and so we won't spark anything. And this car was destroyed. It, it rolled several times, got intertwined with another vehicle. But when I, when I went to cut the battery cables, there laid the necklace. And I was like, oh my God. I had to body, I had to take her body out of the vehicle. And it was his bartender. And the thing I didn't connect with what happened that day was I'd be out drinking with my friend, same friend. And he used to come up to me and says, why do you have to be such a jackass to girls? He goes, my God, they didn't do anything. You were nice, you know, they're being nice. They wanted to talk and all of a sudden you just blow them away. You know, just push them away. And, and I didn't understand why until after my therapy. They, were have, they had necklaces on. And every time I seen a necklace, I'd flash back to that day of losing my friend and how she was cheated out of life at 18, 19 years old. So the triggers. And then right after that, every time that happened, I would leave and go snort a line. I was running from my demons. And I was using some very unhealthy coping mechanisms. But since my recovery, Again, I couldn't shut up about it, so I started talking to the local fire departments. Next thing you know, I'm at the fire chief's conference up in Duluth, and I blew him out of the water. Finally, somebody's talking about the elephant in the room. No more sweeping it under the rug. Let's talk about this, because there was nothing there for me. The fire service had nothing. In fact, when I was going through this, I said, Scott, you need help? You gotta figure this out and design something for everybody else. <laughs> I'm in no condition to do that. I could barely breathe. But I did. I didn't shut up about it. I went out and talked to people. I went out and became a certified peer support specialist. I started working in mental health crisis stabilization and became a mental health practitioner, not through going to college, but the experience I had working and the experience I had in life. I had psychiatrists ask if I could talk, if, if their clients could talk to me because they had a wall. They couldn't connect with them. And they wanted, and, they, and all their clients kept talking about was Scott at this place. You know, he, he understands me. So I was kind of the middle person and built that trust up. And then they could start the therapy. And <laughs> tell you what, it's amazing to see people walking around that one day, they were going to be dead. I've been credited with interfering with over 100 suicide attempts. 100, over 100 people have told me that they would have been dead. Sometimes it was in person, sometimes it was on the phone. Most of them were professionals. Yesterday I spoke at the Fargo Dome to students. It was about 300 of them there, two, 300 of them, and to hear the stories. I never thought my presentation would be PG enough to talk to students about. Man, these kids are not stupid. With social media, they see a lot. They reach out to me more than anybody else. My phone's been just going crazy lately. Thing is, they're also looking out for their parents. When I was in Mo when I was in Pierce, South Dakota, I had a kid reach out to me after the presentation and said, my dad's probably gonna kill himself. I know he is. He had all the symptoms and I started talking to him. He goes, I can't ask him. I said, somebody's gonna have to ask him. So we role played. He pretended I was his dad and he role played it. I got a phone call from his dad later that night. I ended up going back and talking to more people. He was planning on taking himself within a week's time. He had everything in order. 
He was a first responder. I seem to be in the right place at the right time now. I make myself available. We were talking about, you know, he was talking about earlier about, you know, being free and sober. I'll never touch meth again. They'd have to stand on my chest and I don't think they'd ever get it in me. I'd fight it so much. But I'm able to go to the bars and have two drinks. I'm able to meet people where they're at. I cannot believe it. I used to drink to get drunk. I used to pick the darkest bars out there. And if somebody wants to meet in a dark dungeon, sorry, we got to meet somewhere colorful because I can't go to that place. I'm not going back there. But to be able to go and have a couple drinks and use my secret weapon to get them out of the car, out of the bars, that's my secret weapon. He came into my life. I was supposed to get a service dog. This dog was underneath. He was, he was a rescue dog. They dumped him off. He was under a car for three days. Wouldn't come out for anybody. I took my younger son out watching these German Shepherds get trained. I'm in line to get a silver lab, a thousand dollar dog, pick of the litter. Beautiful dog, hunting dog. I can go hunting with it. I'm walking at these German Shepherds like, these things are, what the heck? Who would want a German Shepherd? You can't hunt with them. I look back five minutes after leaving my son. He's sitting by the car with Sarge on his lap. I'm like, oh, God, no. I go back, and it's like either I take Sarge with me or I leave my son there. So he came into our life. We don't know. We never did a blood test on him, but in the lower right side, if you look, you can see kind of little mule deer in him. But he, I think he's Corgi and German Shepherd, kind of a weird mix. But he made a difference in my life. He uh, became a service dog, a licensed service dog, Patriot Assistant dog. Um, not too many dogs can come off from underneath a car and be good enough to have the temperament and, and so much love. That middle picture is by Daniel Sundell. He's an artist from Canada. I just met him about two weeks ago down in Minneapolis. I did a presentation right behind his. He's amazing. He does with mental health in pictures. And there, oh my God, I can really relate to him. I mean, some people can look at him and think, oh my God, it's so dark. It's like, it's reality. And that's why I talk the way I talk. A lot of people are like, you can't talk about this, you can't talk about that. It's like, this is real. You know, I'm not going to go out to offend anybody or hurt anybody. That's not what I do. But I want people to understand that there's help out there. And I was in a very dark place. Sarge did not necessarily help me get this. But he sure had made a connection with my now fiance. And I never thought I could have a relationship open and honest and tell her anything. And she calls me out of my shit, man. If I'm down, either I got a 100-pound German Shepherd on my lap, sitting on my lap when I'm trying to watch TV because he can sense that I'm depressed, or she calls me out on it. And I love it. She's a very strong woman, and that's what I needed. you know. And we call each other out. We both lost our moms a year ago. And it's very difficult. Her brother, we had to uh, find him some housing. He's... Got a mentality about eight, about a eight year old. Um, so we had to find him a, a safe place and she was, her mom was taking care of him. So our worlds got turned upside down. Not only did my, my mom die, but my, my brother was on his deathbed too. And he pulled through, thank God. But we went through a lot and I look back at it, I, even when we we're going through it, it was weird because one day she'd be pushing me away. You know, you, I, could, I sensed it. and then. Next day, I'd be kind of like, oh, you know, pushing her away. And we knew enough about mental health. She didn't know much about mental health before she met me, but she studied it. She educated herself about who I am, and it was so cool. She's retired now and gets to travel with me when I go around the country speaking. It's my support. When I drive, Sarge comes with, too. When I speak in front of students and a lot of other groups, he can't be in the same room with me when I'm speaking, because his job is to make sure I don't go back to what I was just talking about. But we open the door and he charges. He comes in, he can sense, I need some picking up. Well, life is just so much different now. I talk about post-traumatic success, PTSD, addiction, 
suicidal thoughts. It doesn't have to be a life or death sentence. There's help out there. There's ways to work through it. Coping skills. I never even heard of coping skills before I crashed. Didn't know there was a way out. You know, there's no, there's no therapy that works for everybody. There's this whole different, there's a whole bunch of them. They're even using uh, acid, LSD now. I mean, it's amazing and it's working. I mean, who would ever think? But you know, I think back, and I don't, I'm not recommending this by no means, but I look back to when I did them three lines of meth. And I talked to a psychiatrist who goes, that might have had something to do with it. Obviously, you had meth in you. It's like, but it, it, I don't know, it is scary to think about how many people are ending their lives when they don't even have the resources in front of them and don't have the knowledge to know they can get out of it. That car accident I talked about back in 2010 where that young individual drowned. The vehicle was upside down, the back window was shattered. We're assuming it flooded immediately. He was on seat belted. It was dark, cold. He spun before he got to the water edge and he flipped and it went out a little bit on the ice and then flipped off the ice upside down. That vehicle flooded immediately with ice cold water. I couldn't even imagine getting your seatbelt off, much less getting out of the vehicle. The vehicle was in gear, ignition was on, in gear. The doors automatically lock on this model. It was a GMC, it wasn't a Ford. If it was a Ford, he could have pulled on the door opening, the door would have opened up if it wasn't too much in the mud. This was a GMC, you have to manually unlock it. He didn't have time for that. Something else he didn't know, and if he would have known, he would have probably been alive today. He was in three feet of water. The bottom of that vehicle, where the feet were, most likely had an air pocket. If he would have known he was even upside down and knew he was in three feet of water, he could have got to that air pocket and he very much would have been alive today. The reason I'm telling you about that and why I feel it's really important is because when people go through a crisis, when people are in this place, there's always an air pocket. I want to let, I want to let people know that there's therapy out there. There's a way out. Suicide is not the answer. And the, the quicker you reach out, the better. And start seeing in color again. And post-traumatic success is real.